we're good to go. Joshua, you of all people know that that couldn't be further from the truth. It seems the Trail series is something that always gets brought up nowadays when people are asking for good JRPG recommendations. I caught wind of these games when I saw Cold Steel on Steam one day and it looked pretty cool. I actually wanted to play that, but after doing a little bit of digging, I learned that there's like five other games that occur before the Cold Steel series. Apparently this also isn't like Final Fantasy, Tales, or Shin Megami Tensei where you can skip around and pick and choose what you want to play. Every game matters, and I kept hearing the best way to play these games are in release order, so that's what I decided to do. It didn't take me long to figure out that Trails in the Sky FC was the true first game of the series. It starts off the Trails series, which itself is part of a bigger series, The Legend of Heroes. I've had this in my library for quite some time, but I didn't get around to playing it until recently. The game was released on PC in 2004, and it was ported to PSP in 2006. However, this was only for Japan. There was a lot of text to translate, and it didn't make it to the West until 2011. Sky FC also got released on the PS3, and it even got a remake for the Vita a few years later, going by the name of Trails in the Sky FC Evolution, but these were also Japan only. If you want to play the game today, it's readily available on Steam. System requirements are pretty low, it could probably run on your grandma's old laptop. That pretty much covers the game's background. Just like with most of my reviews, I'll talk about the setting, then I'll get into the things I liked, the things I didn't like, parts of the story that stuck out to me, and then, if I still have any lingering comments, I'll conclude with that. Now, FC takes place on the continent of Zamoria, and the story focuses on two kingdoms, Liberal and Erebonia, and both of these kingdoms were at war with each other. It's implied that Erebonia was giving Liberal a run for their money until a man named Cassius Bright stepped in and turned the tide in their favor. It leads people to kinda idolize the guy, like, oh, Cassius, you know, he carried the entire army, he's so great, but just keep that in mind because it does have some plot significance a little later. Anyway, Liberal did win the war, and it's currently the leading nation in orbital energy. Think of, like, the Materia from Final Fantasy VII, but people use that instead of electricity and gas. They can be refined into these gemstones called quartz to power streetlights, vehicles, vacuum cleaners, cameras, and the like. Ten years after the war, Cassius finds a wounded boy named Joshua in the woods and brings him home. There's a rather humorous exchange between Joshua, Cassius, and his daughter Estelle, and they decide to adopt him. Five years after that, Estelle and Joshua are about to take the test to become bracers. Now, during first few hours, I did call the bracers police, but apparently the whole part of them being non-governmental went completely over my head the first time I played. So now I'm not too sure what they're supposed to be. They solve cases, they slay monsters, and they protect citizens, and they do all that while maintaining political neutrality, and that allows them to have branches all over the continent, so I don't know. Let's call them the super cool good guys who get shit done. Is that a good enough simplification for y'all? They pass the test, and you basically spend most of the game traveling around and solving cases because one of Estelle and Joshua's main goals is also to become senior bracers by the end of the game. Um, now things do ramp up pretty late into the game, but it's pretty chill up until then. So we're gonna talk about what I liked about the game. Well, first of all, I loved the attention to detail because almost all of the NPCs you encounter have names, and they all feel like people. A lot of them actually have some pretty interesting dialogue and they usually have different things to tell you over time. So like if you just enter a town and you start talking to people, what they say then will probably be totally different from what they say at the end of the chapter. And while I'm on the topic of characters, I love the dynamic between Estelle and Joshua. Estelle's really outgoing, both figuratively and literally, because she really likes the outdoors and she's also very impulsive, but never to a fault. She fills the hot-headed protagonist trope that you see often in anime without coming off as really dumb or really annoying or, you know, just a total caricature of the role she's supposed to play. That part of her personality just never really overstays its welcome. Joshua, on the other hand, is pretty much the opposite. He's very reserved, he thinks before he speaks, he's usually the one to kind of hold Estelle back when shit hits the fan, and, you know, she's ready to throw hands and all, but he mostly likes reading, playing his harmonica, you know, indoor stuff. And it's just little details like that that make the game feel a bit more alive. Like, you can tell that they're supposed to be of a certain archetype, or they're supposed to serve a certain role in the story, but that's never all there is to them. Like, yeah, Estelle is the hothead, and Joshua is the quiet lone wolf, but that doesn't define them, you know? Like, there's still times where Estelle still makes smart decisions. There are times where Estelle does think before she acts. Alternatively, there are times where Joshua might act rashly. So, I feel like that's just more realistic, because people in real life aren't cookie-cutter. 
they're usually more of a mix of different personality traits instead of just one. And I kind of like how the game sort of pays attention to that and makes it so that certain characters might not always react to a situation the way you think they are. Sometimes they do stuff differently. And like I said, it's a pretty minor detail. It's easily something they could have overlooked, but I'm glad they didn't because it really just adds that much more to the experience. Now, I can't really say what I want to say about the other characters without getting into spoilers, so I'll talk about the rest of them a bit later. The battle system was decent, and it had enough of its own thing going on to keep it interesting. It's turn-based and on a grid. Attacks all have different ranges, so you can spend turns moving around. If you want to melee the enemy, you'll have to be near them to do so. You can view the turn order to the left of the screen, and it can be manipulated with speed spells and other special abilities. Speaking of which, the magic. They're called arts, but you know, same difference. Remember how I mentioned orbital energy and how people use quartz to power their technology and vehicles? There's also this little handheld device called an orbment, and installing quartz in here allows the user to cast spells. There are seven types of quartz in the game. Blue quartz, which is water. Brown quartz, which is earth. Red quartz, fire. Green quartz, wind. Black quartz, time. Gold quartz, space and Silver Quartz Mirage. Each flavor of Quartz also provides different stat increases in addition to whatever spells you're granted. Water Quartz typically focuses on raising max HP and healing arts. Earth Quartz usually raises defense. Fire Quartz raises attack power at the cost of defense. Wind Quartz can raise evasion or magic defense. Black Quartz can raise speed or cut the time needed to cast spells. Because it actually takes two turns to cast spells, one turn to select it and the next turn to actually cast it. Gold Quartz can determine how far across the grid a character can move in a single turn, and it can also increase your max EP. Finally, Silver Quartz can increase either max EP or Dexterity. Each Quartz has a certain amount of Sepith attached to it, and higher level Quartz have higher Sepith values, and then arranging them on the same colored line will add those Sepith values up. And this is how the game calculates what spells each person gets. So if you're not sure how much Sepith you need to learn something, the notebook has every spell listed in the game and the Sepith you need to acquire it. Most elements typically have two single target skills, an AoE skill, a skill that inflicts a buff or status ailment, and a fancy pants uber skill that hits everyone for massive damage. If you'd like to know what an enemy's weak to, there are four lines shown when you highlight an enemy during battle, and the more elemental orbs you see filled in there, the weaker the enemy is to that element. One last thing I want to talk about are status ailments. You know how in some games they exist, but they don't work on the enemies you'd actually want to use them on? That's not the case in this game. Status ailments, for the most part, work pretty well in this game, and one of them shines above the rest. Chaos Brand. So, Chaos Brand inflicts confusion on your target, and it's insane how many people and monsters in this game are not immune to this thing. If I'm not mistaken, I think only a handful of um, enemies actually resist it. I think there's like two monsters you might see relatively early in the game that could resist it, but they're pretty weak so you can tear them apart with other stuff. There's a boss at the end of Chapter 2 that's immune to it, and there's a couple of scripted fights where it won't work either, but those are scripted so that's to be expected. And it obviously doesn't work on the final boss or the person you fight right before it, so I don't think that's much of a surprise. Everyone else though, they're fair game. That includes other bosses too. If you're fighting something and they're hitting like a truck, Chaos Brandom. Boom. This game doesn't have an easy mode, but I just told you how to play on it. Arts aren't the only skills you have at your disposal. Each character can also learn crafts, and these are utility skills that consume the CP bar at the bottom. It's different for every person, but generally they can deal AoE melee damage, buff allies, heal, and other special stuff. Just keep in mind that unlike the arts, the crafts don't take two turns to pull off, so if you need to do something immediately, and you have a craft that'll work, it's probably better to go with that instead of an art. I'd say Joshua's Flicker was one of the most useful arts because you learn it pretty early on and he attacks in a straight line to delay enemy turns. And just like Chaos Brand, it works on most enemies and bosses in the game. There's a character named Chloe who you meet a little later and she has a craft called... Uh, how do I pronounce this? I'm gonna butcher this one. Uh, Keepfer? Kamfer? I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that, but basically she sends her bird after the target and it completely neuters them. Lowers the strength, lowers the defense, and you will notice how much more damage you do, and how much little damage they do. Each character also has an S-Craft, and this is basically a super move that you can pull off when their CP is at least 100. For most characters, it's going to be a fancy looking combo attack that does big damage to a single target. Later on, some characters may learn a stronger version of that move, or they may learn another move that hits everyone 
instead of just one person. There's also a thing called S-breaking, and I'm mad that I didn't realize this was a thing until my second playthrough. You see that red orb that appears when your CP hits 100? Well, with S-breaking, you can select it during an opponent's turn and interrupt what they're doing with that character's S-craft. Pretty useful if you're fighting a whole bunch of enemies and they have a string of turns coming before your party can move again. The next couple of things are really just quality of life stuff. I like how you can automatically run away from enemy encounters, especially since the game makes you go back and forth between the town and the field quite a bit. So unless you're farming Sepeth, grinding doesn't really do a lot for you because the game's pretty good on catching you up if you do happen to become underleveled. And also, sometimes you're just trying to get your fetch quest done and you don't really feel like fighting, you know? I also like how there are no save points in the game, instead you just save from the main menu because this means you can save anywhere as long as you're not in the middle of a cutscene or a fight. It's just nice knowing that it's not the end of the world if I'm playing and I get interrupted, and this actually meant I could comfortably play the game on my laptop in bits and pieces on a whim without having to, you know, plan a chunk of my day to do it. I wish more games were like this, honestly. The PC version does have a turbo mode, so if you're walking across long distances or you're in the middle of a fight and it's kinda dragging, the right trigger is your friend. And lastly, the story. I can't say much about it without getting into spoilers, but I thought it was pretty good. Oddly enough, as I was playing FC, I kinda thought, eh, you know, it's great, but it ain't the universe-shattering masterpiece that some people were making it out to be. But the end was pretty hype. And I must warn you, if you're playing through Sky FC and you realize you like it, just pick up the second one while you're at it, because you will want to hop right on it once you're done with this, alright? Don't say I didn't warn you. Okay, so, bad things. Honestly, I don't have much, and some of the things that I do have to say are closer to minor nitpicks than outright problems. First of all, my biggest criticism is probably the story. Yeah, I know, I just finished praising it, but it doesn't really get too exciting until close to the end of Chapter 2, which for me was about 14 hours in. Maybe longer if you're taking your time and doing all the side quests. But up until that point, you're just doing detective work around the kingdom. If you feel you like the characters though, I do encourage you to stick it out because like I said, it really picks up after chapter 2 and they completely floor it during chapter 4, which is the last chapter. And like I said, the last few scenes at the end were pretty mind-blowing. But yeah, the slow burn at the start can understandably be a turnoff to some people. Also, a few of the boss battles can be kinda ridiculous, if I'm being honest. This didn't happen enough to ruin the game for me, but just be warned there are times where you only have Estelle and Joshua in the party, and the game thinks pitting you against six enemies that get to move first is a good idea, but thankfully you can restart the fight if you get bodied, so like I said, it's not that big of a deal. And that's pretty much all I have to say as far as negatives go, so now let's get into the story. I'm not going to try and summarize the entire thing like I did last time, we'd be here all day. I'm just talking about the rest of the cast, the parts I found interesting, and the stuff leading up to the ending. Oh, also, spoilers. If you're interested in playing the game yourself, this is your warning, so if you're still here at this point, I'm assuming you either played or you don't care, so let's get into it. Sherezard, Shurazard, Charizard, whatever you want to call her. She actually doesn't get a whole lot of screen time. Uh, she was Estelle and Joshua's mentor when they were still training, but she definitely did the most during the prologue in the first chapter. We don't really see her again until the end of the game. And when I say the end, I mean like maybe an hour before the final dungeon. Olivier is the best character in this game. I'm sorry, this guy is amazing, and the fact that everyone else can't stand him makes him even better. Let me just give you a little preview into the greatness that is Olivier. So Estelle, Joshua, and Shara got accused of conspiring with some Sky Bandits, and they were locked in jail until further notice. Well, Olivier happens to be one cell over, so of course he decides to tell everyone how he got there. This man went to the city's most luxurious restaurant, and you know, he ate his meal, and then he went looking for something to wash it down with. He goes to the restaurant's basement, and he finds some wine and he drinks it. Except it was no ordinary wine. It was some expensive wine that was auctioned off and worth half a million Mira, also known as the pride and joy of that restaurant. Olivier drinks it, and then he goes to the manager and offers him a drink, and you can just imagine the look on his face when he's getting hauled away and he doesn't know why, and then he realizes everyone's dozed off during his story and is all like, guys, you still there? I still haven't talked about the trial yet. Even though that event in the game was told to you and not shown, the fact that it leaves all that up to the imagination just makes it even funnier. Anyway, it does turn out that that whole thing with the wine was just him playing dumb because, in reality, he is from Erebonia, who, I'll remind you, was the nation that Liberal was just at war with, and he was over in Liberal trying to gather information on Cassius Bright for reasons that the game didn't explain. But that wine scene was still funny in the moment, though. Okay, a gate. He's kind of in and out of the narrative. Cassius entrusted him with chasing down the men in black, the other men in black, 
there we go. They're basically the antagonist group of the game. He usually leaves the party just as quickly as he comes in, and to be fair, I like this guy the least. The dude's an asshole, I'm sorry. I mean, you can tell he cares, don't get it twisted, but man. And they do explain why. He was formerly a member of the Ravens, which is a gang in the city of Ruin, and one day Cassius came along and wrecked his shit so bad he turned around and became a bracer, so there you go. But he does have a pretty rough background. Next up is Chloe. Sound the alarm, stop what you're doing, evacuate the building, we've got ourselves a best girl alert. She sticks with you for most of chapter two and really she's cool and all, but I only give her the title of best girl because of what she brings to the table. When she decides to help you fight for the first time, she's all like, well, I'm a novice, I probably won't do that well. Meanwhile, she has all of her orbit slots unlocked and filled. She has almost all the healing spells. She's got Hellgate, which is pretty OP at that point in the game. And if that wasn't enough, her S-Craft can heal everyone and revive KO'd allies. Sitting here saying you're not that great, meanwhile all your friends respect you because you steamrolled the entire school during the fencing matches. She can almost carry you through chapter two, unless maybe you're playing on a really, really hard difficulty. But she even gives you all her water quartz when she leaves your party, so waifu material, moving on. Tita is the most precious thing in this game and must be protected at all costs. Not quite on the level of theme from God Eater 3, but she's still pretty precious. Even a gate doesn't stand a chance against those puppy dog eyes. She's a mechanic who works under her grandpa who, if you didn't know, is basically the mastermind behind Orbital Technology. And that's great and all, but I just want to know in what world do people let a 12-year-old kid just run around with an Orbital Cannon like that? And fun fact, it turns into a minigun during her S-break. Like, <laughs> damn. Zen is the final companion you get to work with in this game. He shows up near the end, so I don't really have a lot of noteworthy things to say about him, aside from the fact that he's like twice as large as all the other characters and he's really good in battle. He's got a lot of HP, probably due to being like 15 levels ahead of everyone else when you first meet him, and he hits pretty hard, so he's definitely a tanky boy, but like I said, you meet him relatively late, so I don't really know enough about him to form an opinion on him like everyone else. But that's pretty much it as far as the main characters are concerned. Another reason the game kind of stood out to me is because it's pretty down to earth for a JRPG. And I think one big example is religion and how it's portrayed in the game. Yeah, it's kind of ironic because I'm claiming that that's what makes it feel down to earth of all things, but hear me out. So most of the characters in the game are religious and they believe in this goddess called Adios. And fun fact, I didn't notice the extra I until I had to say the word myself, so I called her Adios during my entire first playthrough. Whoops. Anyway, it was just unusual for me to see a deity portrayed in a positive light because normally JRPGs kind of go with the whole God's acting up, he's being a big jerk, now go punch him in the face kind of story. And if religion does happen to be brought up, it's usually not presented as a good thing. It's often some crazy ass cult where the leader has his followers doing some weird stuff and they may or may not be the secondary antagonist in the whole ordeal. It was different, it made the game feel different, and to be honest, it was a bit refreshing. And it led to some funny conversations too, like a character might do something completely crazy and they'll just be like, oh, Adios, forgive me. Or there's this one scene early in the game where Estelle and Joshua go to their hometown's nearby mine. Now there's a cave-in while they're there and two of the miners are panicking. One's religious and the other's an atheist, and they're having this back and forth. The religious guy is all like, oh, Adios, help us, and then the atheistic one is all like, oh, come on, that fairy tale nonsense isn't gonna help us now. And then the religious one is all like, well, maybe if you had some faith, the mine wouldn't have caved in to begin with. And I just found that funny because I could totally see a conversation going like that in real life. As a matter of fact, I totally have, but I'm not trying to say one avenue of storytelling is inherently better than the next. I'm just saying I've seen a lot of one side, and it's kind of cool to just see a little bit of the other for once. While I'm on the topic of funny moments, and I kind of implied this back when I talked about Olivier, but this game in general is pretty funny. I found all the characters to be pretty likable, yes, even you to an extent, and there were moments where I genuinely just laughed out loud at what was going on. Or, you know, I did the opposite of laughing too. Oh, god damn, alright, who's cutting the onions in here this time? But I think I've really driven my point home. The game has good characters that'll make you laugh, cry, and everything in between. Nobody's fake around here. Except you. You're very fake. You too, by the way, we'll get back to you soon. So for the story itself, as I said before, it's a slow burn until like the end of chapter two. Cassius goes missing and he leaves a mysterious black orbment behind with Estelle and Joshua. 
You solve a big case, you find out who was behind it, you beat him up, you bring him in. And one thing that seems to always happen is every time you catch the culprit, it seems that they always have no memory of what they just did. Which leads to some of the more observant party members like Agate and Joshua to believe that someone or something is controlling influential people and using them to wreak havoc across the country. Estelle and Joshua eventually end up in Zeiss, which is where most orbital technology is developed and produced. This is where Professor Russell lives, and they ask him if he can examine the Black Orbman and find out more about it. Unfortunately, before he can do that, the men in black bust into the factory one day. They kidnap the Professor, and they take the Black Orbman. They were also disguised as the Queen's Royal Guard during the kidnapping, so of course, once the incident hits the news, all the blame falls on them. So now the Royal Guards are considered terrorists, and this basically leaves everything in the hands of the military's intelligence division. And the culprit behind everything was none other than Colonel Richard himself, the same guy who was all nice and cool with you a few chapters ago. So yeah, Richard and his bitchy sidekick, whose name I can't remember, uh, she's annoying, she's got pink hair, and she folds pretty easily in a fight. Uh, let's just call her Sakura until I can remember. Anyway, they're the main antagonists of the game, and the men in black you keep running into are Intelligence Division soldiers. They were just using the chaos to slowly gain more and more influence across the country, and by the final chapter, Richard and the Intelligence Division basically have everything except the throne. Estelle, Joshua, Tita, and Agate bust the Professor out of the military fortress, and the Professor tells Estelle and Joshua to go to Grand Soul, the royal city, and warn the Queen about the Black Orbment and what Richard plans to do with it. Now, they head over there, and due to the threat of terrorists looming over everyone, security is really tight over there. So Estelle and Joshua can't just walk into the castle and talk to the queen. Fortunately, there's a martial arts tournament being held, and the prize is a dinner party at the castle. So Estelle and Joshua enter the tournament along with Zinn and Olivier, who happen to be screwing around in the city at the time. They win, and they get to infiltrate the castle. Well... Estelle, Joshua, and Zinn do. They make Olivier stay behind because since he's a foreigner, they don't want him getting blamed for anything crazy that happens while they're in the castle. I genuinely feel bad for him because he did put in work during that tournament. At the dinner party, Estelle, Joshua, Zinn, as well as the mayors of the other cities, learn that according to Richard, the queen plans to advocate the throne and hand it over to her nephew, Duke Dunin. Now, Dunin ain't exactly what we call the brightest quartz on the orbital circuit, and I don't know how that butler can put up with him on a daily basis and still retain his sanity. That man has the self-restraint of a god. But anyway, if Dunin were to become king, that would basically put Richard in charge. After dinner, Estelle and Joshua go to see the queen. The queen's quarters are pretty heavily guarded, so they have to use maid disguise to get past the harsh security. They meet with the Queen, and she basically tells them that Richard was full of baloney. Remember how I said Cassius helped turn Erebonia on its head during the Hundred Days War? Well, Richard really idolized him, and he didn't take too kindly to Cassius leaving the military once the war was over. He became obsessed with trying to increase Liberals' military might, because even though the war was over, things still weren't hunky-dory between the two countries, and I guess Richard figured that it was only a matter of time before Erebonia or another country decided to make their move. Plus, Plus, this game does take place in like the late 11, early 1200s, so even though they're more technologically advanced than we were in the Middle Ages, there's still a couple of things that people don't approve of today that would probably make us go, really? You're hung up on that? One of which being the stigma of having a queen ruling the country, as that's apparently seen as a sign of weakness. So Richard was all like, oh, damn, we already have a queen and the heir is also a girl. We're about to get two in a row, you might as well slap a bullseye on liberal. We're gonna be the laughingstock of the whole continent. And you're not told this until a couple hours later, but Liberal is actually a fraction of the size and military might of its neighboring countries. All that they really have going for them is orbital technology, so Richard's paranoia doesn't come out of thin air. Anyway, that's his motivation. Liberal ain't hardcore enough, and we need to show other countries we mean business. And the Queen says it's actually an old relic that can unlock some weird, ancient power buried deep below the castle. She doesn't go too deep into specifics on what Richard plans to do once he uses it, but there's actually a good reason for that, and I'll get back to it later. So after their stay at the castle, Estelle, Joshua, and the Bracer Guild team up with the Royal Guard to bust Princess Claudia and the rest of the Intelligence Division prisoners out of the Royal Villa. Shara and Olivier get in on the action too, and this is where Claudia reveals that she and Chloe are the same person. Well, at least to Estelle, because everyone else kind of put two and two together a while back, and honestly, if you were kind of paying real close attention to the story, you probably might have figured it out too. Anyway, now that they've taken back the villa, they need to take back the castle. 
The group splits up. Joshua, Olivier, and Zinn enter the castle through the sewers and open the gate. Then the royal guards and the bracers barge in with a frontal assault, while the intelligence division soldiers are busy trying to fend off the intruders up front, Estelle, Shara, and Chloe take an airship to the top of the castle to go rescue the queen. They find Sakura and, well... Did I or did I not say Sakura folds easily in a fight? It only took Chaos Brand and a couple S-Crafts to bring her down. On their way up, they run into the Intelligence Division's second lieutenant, Lawrence. Now, the game's been building up Lawrence for a while now. A gate's been chasing him around for a good chunk of the game, and it's implied that Lawrence and Joshua do have some kind of history as well, as the latter always becomes a bit uneasy when the former's brought up. Lawrence takes off his helmet, revealing his face for the first time, and he gets ready to fight the three girls. I do find it kind of interesting, he said, I'm not going to go easy on y'all just because you're women. Man, that's what I like to see. Equality across the board. Uh-oh. Ooh. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, that fight is totally scripted. Even if you actually manage to put a dent in him, he'll start healing faster than you can hurt him, so don't worry, you're supposed to lose that. At least his boss theme is cool, though. Probably the only other memorable song in this game besides the final dungeon and final boss themes. So after delivering the most brutal ass whooping in the entire game, Lawrence packs it up and heads off to who knows where. At this point, Joshua, Zinn, Olivier, and the Royal Guard make it to the top floor. Richard's already headed underground because the item he needs, the Shining Ring, is actually way under the castle. That's why he seized control of it, and when the group heads to the treasury, it turns out that he had an entire elevator built to take him down there. Tita, Agate, and Russell show up, and Russell has a device to override the elevator security and take them underground. So the group heads after Richard. This is the final dungeon in the game, and also the only place where you do have some measure of control over who gets to be in your party. Estelle and Joshua are locked in, but you can choose any of the other playable characters you spent time with throughout the game to fill the other two spots. I personally went with Shara, since it's been a minute since she's been in the party, and I also took the Chad Zinn since he could actually take a couple hits. You run into Amalthea about halfway through the dungeon. Hey, I remembered her name. Too bad the game's almost over though. You take her down and the group makes a pit stop. The game lets you modify your party one last time before the final boss. At that point, I took best girl Chloe and best boy Olivier. I had already given Joshua a couple water quartz for healing, and I figured having Chloe along would help in case he died. Her S-Craft would also be really helpful in a pinch. As for Olivier, I only took him along because I liked him. I did pump him full of fire and earth quartz to make him somewhat of a long-range tank. I probably could have gotten a better result with Zinn, but I didn't want to use Zinn for the second half of the dungeon. I wanted Olivier. Anyway, you find Richard not too long afterwards. He gives us a little history lesson on the ancient treasures that could control nature. Take notes, that'll probably be on the test. The shining ring he's trying to get his hands on is one of them, and I guess with that kind of power, neighboring nations would think twice about attacking them. Richard's genuinely convinced that the only reason Liberal won the war back then was because Cassius carried the entire kingdom with his mad skills. Estelle then gives him the whole, that's not true, your friends are your power, teamwork makes the dream work, you know, that kind of spiel. Pretty cliche, but she does point out that, yeah, Cassius might have been a huge help, but everyone still had to work together with him to take back the fallen territories and win the war. Joshua then asks Richard how he found out about the Black Orbment to begin with, and the underground dungeon, and all this other ancient stuff that even the Queen didn't know about. Richard doesn't answer, and Joshua's all like, no, it's because you can't answer. And this is where the realization will kind of creep in. Like, oh, you thought Richard was the culprit, but he was actually being controlled just like all the other guys before him. Someone bigger than Richard is pulling the strings here. And you want to know what's funny? That's not even the biggest plot twist, but we'll get there soon. So, the fight starts, and he's one of the few bosses in the game that resist Chaos Brand, so that means you'll actually have to give him a fair fight. His robot buddies can and will cancel your arts if they get the chance, and fair warning, he does have an S-Craft, so have those revival spells and items ready. You're probably gonna need them. Thankfully, Sieg was on the job, so if you keep using Chloe's Campfer? Campifer? Campalampamampfer? Is there any right way to pronounce that word? They'll go down pretty quickly. Richard's down, but the Black Orbment still activates. The Shining Ring seal has been broken, and a giant, goofy-looking robot steps out. I guess he's the security or something, and... Yes, this is the final boss. I know, shocking, right? Is it really a JRPG if you don't fight a god at the end? Like I said, it happens so often, it does feel weird when it's something different. Everyone kept talking about Adio, so I half expected her to come waltzing in like, Haha, it was me all along, but no. 
No, it's a robot. Its name is Reverie, and I don't have too much to say about the first phase. Your levels are probably going to be in the early to mid-30s at this point, so you'll be able to take care of him without much of a problem. Although, I said first phase for a reason, because that's just the easy part. Reverie and his two sidekicks will combine, and we'll just keep calling his new Megazord form Reverie. He'll constantly call up some minions to soften up your HP bars a bit, so focus on using crafts until you malfunction his right arm. I say take advantage of your crafts, because if you try and use arts, more likely than not, he'll be fast enough to cancel them before you can pop it off. Anyway, uh, once his arm malfunctions, then you can have a couple characters spam art since he won't be able to cancel them anymore. I had Olivier cast Earthwall whenever he could because when Reverie's HP gets low, like the sore loser he is, he'll start using a special craft that covers the entire screen, so you can't run away from it. And if you're missing just a little bit of health and you don't have Earthguard's immunity, it'll probably kill your whole party, so just make sure you're either guarded or you have have full HP restored. Oh, also, normal crafts are fine, but please don't spam S crafts unless you absolutely need to. He has this move where if you use a certain amount of S crafts during the fight, he'll randomly just pick a member of your team and be like, you? Yeah, you? You're dead. So, don't do that. Once you've got the fight figured out, it's no longer hard, just time consuming. Uh, once you get Reverie down to zero, he gets back up. I was so scared when I saw that for the first time because on my first playthrough, I barely beat him. I had no EP or items left, so I was like, well, if he starts up again, I'm done for. And take note that your last save was probably an hour and a half ago, right before you talked to Richard. Anyway, Reverie is back up and running, and just when it seems like the Sky Trilogy might end up being a lot shorter than anticipated, Richard grabs the robot's attention. Oh wow, Richard, you caused us all this headache, but you're gonna redeem yourself now? Okay, that's cool. I guess. Nope! <laughs> Cassius shows up out of nowhere and frees Richard from Reverie's grip. The rest of the group finishes the job with their S-crafts, or in Chloe's case, the overpowered white Gehenna, because, you know, her S-craft actually can't do any damage, but, you know, details, details. So yeah, the man you were spending the entire game looking for just pops up like it's nothing. Richard then goes into this whole rant that if Cassius is here, then that means his plan is as good as foiled, and Cassius is all like, nah, man, you lost about 90 in-game minutes ago. These guys would have had it in the bag anyway. And then Richard is all like, no, you're Cassius Bright. You're the chattest of chads. I only lost because everyone heard you were coming. The only reason we won that war 10 years ago is because you went and blessed us with your strategic thing. Thinking. Before Richard can say anything else, Cassius Falcon punches him in the face and tells him that he left the army to go take care of his family. He said he trusted Richard to keep the army from falling to pieces while he was away and, well, we all know how that turned out. The entire intelligence division is arrested. Except Sakura. She's still in hiding. Estelle and Joshua are promoted to full-fledged bracers, and Cassius is actually going back to the army because he wants to help clean up the mess that Richard left behind. The Queen's birthday celebration goes without much of a hitch. You're free to walk around the city and talk to whoever you'd like, the highlight being a short side quest ending in a rather humorous exchange between Olivia and his escort, Mueller, who you can tell has just about had it up to here with his shit. But yay, you know, happy ending! Or at least that's what you thought was going to happen. Estelle and Joshua head over to the bench to rest, and Estelle goes to get the two of them ice cream. While she's away, Professor Alba comes to see Joshua. Now, I actually went through this entire review without saying anything about Alba, so he was a traveling archaeologist who Estelle and Joshua bumped into every now and then during their travels. He seemed like a pretty cool guy, you know, just a dude trying to follow his passions with the limited funds he has. However, Joshua notices that there's something different about Alba this time. My, my Alba. What convenient timing you have. My, my, Alba, what a suspicious portrait you have. So yes, Alba's real name is Weissman the Faceless. I don't know why he calls himself that. It looks like he has a face to me. Also, I know his name is Weissman, but I'll just call him Alba for the rest of the video. We'll call him Weissman in the next game. He's one of the seven snake apostles who are part of a bigger group called Ouroboros. He has the power to manipulate other people's memories, so he's the one who orchestrated all the crimes we cleaned up throughout the game, including the coup d'etat that Richard was planning. Lawrence worked under him, and he's the one who introduced the Black Orbman and all the talk about the Shining Ring to Richard, but it turns out they were just using Richard to do all the grunt work and undo the seal on the ring. And don't think for a minute that none of this has anything to do with Joshua. Joshua was basically a genetically modified super assassin working under Alba. Apparently, some big accident happened that completely broke him as a kid, and then Weissman took him in and did some weird experiments on him and turned him into a cold-blooded killer for Ouroboros. 
Ouroboros. One day, Ouroboros told him to target Cassius Bright, but that didn't work out too well because Cassius beat the shit out of him. Ouroboros tried to kill Joshua at that point to get rid of the evidence, but then Cassius came back and saved him. So that's how he met Joshua in the woods and took him back home, which is what you saw at the beginning. However, this was part of their plan because then they used Joshua as a spy to relay information on Cassius and the Bracer Guild. Joshua wasn't aware of this because I guess Alba wiped his memory shortly after Cassius adopted him, and then conveniently restored some of it when he needed information, so Joshua was a mole and he didn't even realize it. And he said he knew of his past, so I'm thinking maybe Alba let him keep bits and pieces of his memory? Maybe just a few vague details without all the nitty gritty details about killing people and such. Later that night after the celebratory dinner, Joshua and Estelle meet on top of the castle. Joshua, now that he has all of his memories back, tells Estelle the entire truth, and then he says he's gonna run off and set things right. Of course, Estelle isn't a very big fan of his little solo mission, and she says he doesn't have to do it all alone. She then admits that she loves him, and Joshua kisses her. We might have ourselves a real what do you do in step bro moment, but you didn't hear that from me. They're not related. They only spent five years together, though. Uh, all right, fine. Roll with it. We'll let it slide. Joshua's kiss was laced with some kind of tranquilizer, though, because Estelle starts to feel a bit drowsy. And as she's dozing off, Joshua gets all poetic, and he admits that he loves her, too. And then he takes off, so that's the end of FC. No, seriously, that's where the game ends. After that, they tell you to jot down your clear data and call it a night. Oh, you thought it'd be all over and wrapped up in a nice little bow? Mm-mm, nah. Alba was manipulating memories, but over here at Falcom, we've gotten a hold of something even more valuable. Your wallet. It's not a matter of if you buy SC. It's when you buy SC. I did warn y'all though, if you grow attached to the first game, just pick up the second one, because you're gonna want to play it as soon as you finish this one. That being said though, I do have SC installed and ready to go when I get around to it, but until then, that marks the end of it. So, games ending on a cliffhanger? So am I. Feel free to leave a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel if you'd like to hear me rattle on about other JRPGs or Japanese games I happen to come across, and I will see you all again very soon.